past players sponsored player cabinet dedications and I think it's a great opportunity uh, for us all to be here today to celebrate the career of one of our all-time favourite magpies, Peter McKenna. Um, Peter isn't the only past player here this morning, but you'll find out shortly enough with a special welcome uh, to Barry Price and Ross Twiggy Dunn. Great <laughs> Andrew Smith from the Past Players Association, who will be hearing from shortly. Smithy, welcome to you. And a special welcome to some very dear friends of Peter's. One of Peter's great friends at Collingwood was, was the late uh, lamented Glenn Thompson, who is not only a great footballer, but a great friend of Peter's, and I believe uh, shared a birthday just a year apart. And always had competitions to see who could uh, be the first to win the other on their, on their birthday every year. Um, and so it's, it's great to have Ben's wife, Bronwyn, one of his daughters, Emily, and Emily's partner, Brendan, here today representing Tomo. <laughs> so thank you all for getting involved, and a special thank you and a special welcome to uh, a woman who was at our 1958 function last year, um, having been at the 1958 grand final. Um, so to Mavis Poole, who's uh, just behind you there, Smithy, 97. Um, 98, um, and was going to the footy up until three years ago. So that is the kind of dedication that uh, Collingwood supporters inspired. Good on you, Mavis. And hopefully, there'll be a premiership this year to, to cheer you on. This is the start of what we hope will be uh, a succession of similar functions honouring individual Collingwood players um, in that cabinet that you're seeing out the front. And that's been made possible by the generosity of the Collingwood Past Players Association who have donated that cabinet to the footy club for this very purpose. So I'd like to call upon Vice President of the CPPA, Andrew Smith. President, sorry. Over through Mick when I wasn't looking. President of the CPPA, Andrew Smith, to say a few words. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, and thanks for turning out this morning. I was, probably wasn't expecting to see quite as many people there. It's fantastic. Um, I was just saying to Barry earlier, it's, uh, it's quite, it's not frightening, but it's a, it's a strange realisation when you, uh, I think it was, I think as a nine-year-old catching a train every second week down to Victoria Park with, a, I think it was in grade four or five, and uh, it was, you know, just nearly 50 years ago I was watching Peter and Barry and Twiggy play uh, and th th those memories are vividly etched in my mind under the scoreboard there at Victoria Park where you never miss. And uh, you know, being a Collingwood kid and a Collingwood family and then as a 17 year old, and I was, they called me Put, everyone still calls me Put because I was a fat kid. And, uh, and from a fat kid Collingwood supporter to be invited down as a 17 year old and then to be able to play with these guys uh, and, and sort of leak out you know, 30 or 40 senior games was, was an amazing uh, experience and uh, a dream come true. Uh, about 14 years ago, uh, my first coach here, Keith Burns, got me involved with the past players. Um, and I'm not sure if you're aware, the Collingwood past players has been, uh, been functional and been going in this organisation now for 70 years, which is you know, amazing in itself. Um, there's been, you know, probably 1,270 uh, players that have represented the club at senior level, and there's around 600 um, past players, former players, still living, and and that's who we represent. Um, and we're not trying to change the world. Uh, there's only two things we're we're trying to do. Um, we really just want past players to to stay connected uh, with their teammates, with the club and to maintain that network, which is really important as we, as we grow older, um, and still feel part of it. That's number one. And number two is uh, we try to raise some funds and we try to search out for players who are struggling and provide welfare support for those players who, who might be doing it really tough. So they're the only two things we're trying to do. And today, and what we're all about here today, and why we've donated the Cabinet, is, uh, is all about uh, connection and staying uh, connected with teammates, supporters in the club. So we're really uh, proud and uh, happy to have funded the Cabinet. 
and it's going to be a wonderful chance to uh, to celebrate and showcase uh, amazing careers of uh, of all the former players uh, that we all love and grew up with. So uh, we're really happy to do that. Um, so Michael, uh, thank and Peter, thank you for making this happen. Uh, it's been a great initiative, and you guys have proven it and made it happen. So thank you. Uh, congratulations to Peter. Uh, it couldn't have been a better first choice to uh, to kick this uh, concept off. So it's fantastic. Um, Barry and Twig for coming down. Really great to see you and everyone else here, of course. So uh, we're really looking forward to uh, maybe one or two displays each year where we can uh, showcase and remember uh, former Collingwood greats. And it may not be just the household names, it might be some unique uh, and obscure careers that we might celebrate, but I think it's going to be fun and I think it's going to be great for all, all Collingwood people. So thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for that, Smithy. And, um, and again, just to reinforce what a cracking job the past players do for all the people who've, um, who've pulled on the Collingwood jumper. Uh, they really do a great job, so um, I encourage everybody here to support their work, um, as well as that of the archives. And between the archives and the past players, we feel like we do kind of carry the torch for the club's history and heritage, and making sure that we celebrate the careers of the individual players, all 1,200 plus of them, um, whether they played one game or 313. So um, that will be continued to be our, our joint duty. Um, so now let's turn to the business side of things. Um, it's, it's more than an honour to, <laughs> for me to be doing this today um, because a bit like Smithy, um, the teams that these guys played in were the ones that I grew up with. Um, just a matter of interest, who here had a Collingwood jumper when they were a kid? Who of those had a number six on the back? Well, oh, okay, not, not, not universal. For me, it was, absolutely. I had number six on my back, I wore it on all my junior footy jumpers. My mum got sick of sewing number sixes onto the back of my various jumpers. I tried at one point unsuccessfully to get her to sew a number six onto the back of my school uniform. which. You know, yeah, it was never going to work, but it really should have been. Um, I think in, in those photos uh, before and in the video as well, there was the footage of Peter having socketed the ball off the ground after Twiggy had missed an air shot at the first attempt at socking off the ground for Peter's 100th in 1970. And I jumped the fence and was one of the last onto the ground because I sat right up the other end. So I didn't get within a bull's roar of him. But in my telling over the years, I was, I was almost there until a policeman stopped me from, from touching it. Um, but I wasn't, I didn't get much further than the half-forward flank at the Arrow Falls end, I think. Um, but when you look at those photos and you see the kind of adulation that Peter inspired, you just realise that his popularity was staggering by any measure. Um, in one of the things I've written about Peter, I, I said that if the internet had been around then, and he'd been on Twitter, he would have broken the internet. He was that popular. Um, but the popularity might have been extraordinary, but so were his goal kicking exploits. And in all the talk about Peter's um, uh, extreme levels of fame, which we'll deal with a little later, um, you just forget what a bloody good foot forward he was. And once he got settled, um, there was 98 goals in 1969, 143 in 1970, 134 the next year, 130 after that, and then 86 in 1973. By today's standards, they're extraordinary. When, we was, when Peter and I were setting up the display yesterday, and we had, um, which you'll see, we'll talk about a little later, um, Peter's boot from the 1970 season when he kicked 143 goals. And I was putting that into the cabinet, and one of the younger members of staff here came up and said, oh, you know, what are you doing and what's that for? Um, oh, it's a bronze boot, that's an odd thing to do. Oh, yeah, he kicked 143 goals with it. And you can see her process it and think, 143 career goals, that's not that many. And I was like, no, that was in one season. And she was just dumbfounded, somebody who has been brought up in an era where 40 or 50 goals will often win you uh, a club's goal kicking award. Peter won Collingwood's eight times, but 143 in a season, she couldn't compute that. It just did not work for her. 
Um, as we've already heard from, from Smithy and from me, most of us who idolised Peter did so from outside the fence. We didn't know him, we watched him as, a, as an idol from afar. Um, but the guys who played with him um, to do that were Barry Price. Barry, of course, is a champion in his own right, also features in the Champions of Parliament book. Um, he made his debut the year after Peter, 66, played 158 games, kicked 59 goals, won a Copeland. Um, Peter has always been extremely quick to praise the work of those further afield from him and, and acknowledge that his career would not have unfolded the way it has, the way it did, um, without the support of guys like Barry and John Greening and uh, the Richardson brothers and Tuddy and those kind of guys pumping the ball down his throat from midfield. But for whatever reason, it's Barry um, whose connection with Peter is, has endured most of all. Um, and I think it's fair to say that those two names are sort of inextricably linked um, when people think about the great Collingwood teams of that era. Uh, so Barry, it's great that you could be here today to say a few words um, about your former teammate, but a man who, more importantly, is a great friend. So everybody, please welcome Barry Price. Very special honour to uh, be here and speak uh, about Peter. Uh, it was a larger than life kind of footballer in that uh, late 60s, early 70s period. Recruited from West Heidelberg um, with uh, a close, close neighbour, uh, Ross Twiggy Dunn's here as well. Uh, Ross, as uh, Michael has mentioned, was a great player in his own right. And, uh, terrific that you made the effort to be here, mate. Over 200 games. And, uh, 238 goals, I think. <laughs> For those of us fortunate enough to play with Peter, uh, we had front row seats to an exciting, fast leading, really intelligent footballer for the, for the times. So uh, he just seemed to instinctively know when to lead. And we used to joke a fair bit of training because uh, Wayne used to joke a bit about uh, Peter hiding in the, where the lights weren't too good in front of the social club. And, uh, but he'd actually practice his leading as we came around with the old fashioned circle work. Peter would be seen and he'd really take off, but he knew when to take off on the lead. 1966, of course, in that first game of the season, he kicked 12 goals against Hawthorne. Now, it's just hard to imagine that now, isn't it? Like 12 goals in a game. And, I think yesterday Jeremy Cameron for GWS kicked six and uh, a guy from uh, the Bulldogs, uh, uh, Aaron Norton kicked five last night. So, and we rave about them now, don't we? But to imagine someone kicking 12 or my favourite game where he kicked 16 against South Melbourne at Victoria Park in 1969. Just mind boggling really. It was and still is the best kick for goal I've ever seen. I try and tell young kids, I'm still coaching young kids, I try and tell them now what it was like watching him kick and he's, the basic fundamentals are still the same and he was perfect at it. You know, um, his approach, beautiful balanced approach, um, running straight at the target which was usually over the goal umpire's head, uh, ball in line with his kicking leg, head over the ball, kicking through the ball. It's just a classic action Peter had. We sort of, I remember Wayne and Max and Tomo, lovely to see him over there, Tomo's former partner, Roman. Um, we'd often, it wasn't arrogance at all because Peter would be lining up for goal somewhere out on the angles and it might be 40 metres out, 50 metres, whatever it was, and we'd be heading back to the centre for the, for the next bounce sort of talking about what we might do as a setup with Tomo as the ruckman there. But such was his accuracy. And I, I was saying, when he kicked that 16 goals against South Melbourne in 1969, it's my favourite memory of him, actually. And I, I, I thought he kicked 16-1, but uh, someone told me over the back there that he kicked 16-2 or 3. So uh, still amazing accuracy, wasn't it? I often get asked what sort of game plan we had. You know, everyone talks about game plans now. And um, 
Thus, it, our game plan was to get the ball quickly and directly to Peter McKenna, who was leading uh, into space. And that was, that was basically our, our game plan. It nearly worked in 1970, as we know. Uh, we didn't know at half time that he had concussion. Bob Rose kept that from us, um, understandably, because uh, it would have affected, probably affected our confidence. But uh, Peter had, had kicked five goals up until then, if you remember, at uh, 1970. And um, um, in the second sem semi final, a couple of weeks prior against Carlton, he kicked nine. I think it was nine, Peter. And uh, so obviously Carlton were very worried about it. But just before half time, Tuddy thought he'd clean up uh, Kevin Hall, as Tuddy uh, was very keen to do, clean up someone, and uh, unfort unfortunately cleaned up Peter just before half time. I remember I've, I've seen the footage and I kicked the ball into him. Peter was going for a mark and Tuddy came back across in front of Peter, and I think he's hit, got Peter in the head. So, uh, as I said, we didn't know at half time. So, uh, and Peter still to this day can't remember uh, the second half of that game. Nowadays, of course, he wouldn't have been allowed back on the ground. But, uh, so it nearly worked, our plan nearly worked, but uh, not quite. An indication of Peter's popularity that Michael touched on before was uh, we'd pull up at Lily Street. We all had car parks here in Lily Street, so he'd pull up at, you know, he'd be a bit nervous before the game, and he'd pull up in the street there. And, I set, set aside, you know, all the parks for us, and uh, you know the kids had all rushed to your car, which was terrific. You know, the Collingwood supporters so loyal, and they'd all rush to your car to get your autograph. Just about to be up, get out of your car, and Peter would turn up. They'd all, they'd all leave you, you know, and you walk, you walk in by yourself. <laughs> It was, of course, the uh, game's first uh, multimedia star. Uh, Lou Richards would probably debate, would have debated that, but uh, Lou had finished playing when he went into television and radio, of course. But uh, uh, it's a lot. I'm not, not sure whether we're going to play it. But uh, my wife and I looked at, looked it up last night on YouTube, and one of Peter's hits, and he had a couple of uh, little smile all the while in his song. <laughs> Fantastic. Are we going to play Peter? Or? Yeah, we're hoping. <laughs> Fingers crossed, but uh, it's uh, quite a funny one and uh, sort of indicative of the times, the innocence of the times, and uh, the kids in the audience holding up the Peter McKenna signs. Fantastic. Calling out his name. Uh, we can't forget those songs because he used to sing them every Saturday night. <laughs> That was after Tuddy sang uh, Click Go The Shears for the fifth time. <laughs> Look, uh, you know, it's lovely to see that uh, wood, what you've done out there, the past play. It's lovely to see the uh, display out there. There's a great photo of Peter and uh, Len Thompson when they, in the 1972 carnival uh, over in Perth. And, uh, when you're on, on your way out, have a look, it's down the bottom of the cabinet out there, set up out there. It's a beautiful photo of Peter and Len out there. Look, uh, you know, we were lucky to play in our era. Um, there, were, there were disappointments, of course. Uh, we were all disappointed. We didn't win in 1970, certainly. Twig you know, went really close in 77, of course. And kicked that goal to level the, uh, the, the game. Uh, there were great times, as I said, there were disappointments. But Peter's always been a terrific person, very loyal, uh, sort of over generous in his comments about uh, kicking the ball to him at times, sort of uh, very embarrassing. But uh, uh, we've loved your friendship, Pete, and we uh, hope that continues. And uh, it's terrific you being on it here today. Um, all right, well, now what we're going to do is just have a bit of a, a Q&A with Peter based around some of the items that uh, are in the display. So, 
as we focused on, it's the, the cabinet that's at the core of what we're going to do um, with everything with the past players that we celebrate um, over, the, over the next, hopefully, 10, 20, 30 years. Um, and Pope Peter's generously loaned us um, a number of items and we had some in our existing archives collection. Um, so we're just going to pick six of those, of course. Just that number randomly came to me out of the air. Um, just to use as touchstones to uh, kind of kick off on a uh, discussion that will take us through some of the, uh, the key parts of Peter's career, Peter's career. So please welcome to the stage, Peter McKenna. song anytime you like as well. Actually, I should have got you to bring your guitar. That would have been even better. No, no way. That's, that's <laughs> from a private room. Ah, <laughs> uh, dear. Um, all right, well, look, we'll start with the object number one, which is... I actually won't get up and go get her. I'll be up and down the whole time. I will have You heard Barry speak earlier about Peter's game beginning of 1966. This is the footy from that day. Now, clearly it's had the bejesus kicked out of it, um, but that's the footy that Penny used uh, in the game when uh, Penny kicked 12 against Hawthorne. Uh, the opening round of 1966. And that was a key moment in your career. You'd come to Collingwood the year before, in 65, um, from West Heidelberg, YCW. Um, but you'd actually had a soccer background, hadn't you? And, until sort of mid well, <clears throat> okay. well, I actually grew up in a place called North Turak. <laughs> Some people call it West Arlenburg. Uh, and I, as a little boy, as a little boy, all us little Aussie kids had wander up. Around the corner from uh, Twiggy and No, there was a soccer ground around the corner. It was just around the corner and us little kids used to go around there and kick the footy and there was a hostel in Preston. Um, after the war they built these little round huts so that uh, people came back from the war and so there were a lot of migrants in these huts and they formed the Heidelberg Soccer Club on this little ground in West Heidelberg. So all us, they said to us, little Aussie kids, Twig didn't play soccer, but uh, I did. And I hope one of you boys want to play soccer. Oh, yeah. So I played five years of soccer um, until I was about 13 when I took football seriously because I was playing footy at school. But Twig lived very close to me. It was one of my drop punts to his house. <laughs> and two of his torpedoes. <laughs> he tries to differ about that. And I couldn't believe after seeing him in a film before he actually handballed once in his life. <laughs> a left-handed handball over the top twiggy. What happened? <laughs> uh, anyway, but, and it may have said something about Barry too because I can't go anywhere in this world without saying, you would never have a kick with that Barry Price. <laughs> and Lou Richard used to say to me, look, we know about you. You used to take him home to his bed. I made sure he wasn't my bed. And you'd take him home to his bed and tuck him in at night and fluff the pillows to make sure he got a good night's sleep. <laughs> Lou used to say that all the time, he reckoned I wouldn't have got a kick. And Wayne Richardson gets a bit uh, cr crabby about when Pricey gets all the accolades. And Wayne reckons he gave me more goals than, uh, than Pricey did. But it, it, it's, it's great. It was a great era to play with, and um, with in the 60s and 70s. And the all, we were in the finals nearly every year, but just couldn't crack it. But getting back to that little ground, it was so fantastic. We had these migrants, and there were Italians and there were Yugoslav and my first soccer coach was a Swede. And he was a, they were wonderful men. 
and they like taught us how to dribble the ball and through current and things and we, we went all around Victoria playing soccer. It was incredible and uh, I was a defender, I wasn't a forward. I wanted to kick goals but I, and we used to kick the footy into the soccer goals after school every night and mum would have to come up the park and drag me home in the dark. We just loved it. It was just a great childhood to do that. Thank goodness we rescued you from the, the global game, the world game. It happened to be terrible. You ended up playing as a right half. I still half follow it. I followed Chelsea oh, in the English <laughs> soccer. I'm a mad Chelsea supporter. I'm a mad Liverpool man. So that's the end of it. That's the end of the friendship. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't have anything more to do. In that first game of '66, you had your first season in '65, and you you kicked five in your third game. I think it was against Hawthorne and. You know, been in and out a bit, showing a little bit, but over the pre-season of 60, between 65, 66, you did some running with Bill Toomey Senior to, to get a bit quicker. Then you started with a bang, 12 goals against Hawthorne in opening round. What do you remember of that, that, well, that it performance? Was, uh, Cause it wasn't even a full forward, was it? You were, no, I, I was, my first year, I, I came from junior football and started in an early practice match and Twigger remember those days it was an early practice match and I played fairly well. I was centre half forward then. And um, then you know, they put me in the main senior game the next practice match and the senior blokes were going about half pacing some of those games. So if you were young, you tried to bloody hard out to impress. And um, I played on Johnny Mann, who was a regular centre back and he was much shorter than me. He gave me a lot of confidence. I played pretty well on him. And uh, so when the first game of the season came around, 1965 it was, first game, Collinson were due to play um, St Kilda at Moorabbin. And that's the first time St Kilda ever played at Moorabbin. Anyway, and the sides came, well, we listened to the sides, I didn't think I'd get the first, I went straight in the first. So my first game for Collingwood was in the first. So from junior football straight into the seniors, that's a big step. And uh, and I played set up forward, I played for Lee and Sidman, and I went to full for um, a Brownlow medalist, Burden Howe. And so that was a good introduction, so I didn't play very well. And, um, but I had a good game, yeah, about a couple of weeks later yeah, against Hawthorne, I yeah. think I kicked five goals playing, still playing. But my first year, I was um, mainly centre-half forward. The next year, I was still, I started the first game that 12 goals. I started centre up forward and played the quarter at centre up forward. Then Rosie put me to full forward. Ben Graham went out to centre up forward and I kicked 12 goals after that. And um, it was out of the blue, you know, no one had kicked double figures for years. It was a shock to me, actually. But I had, <laughs> well, I had spent all summer, though, I trained very, very hard down at Warringal Park Heidelberg with the pro runners under old Bill Turney. Uh, Bill Toomey Senior, that's the father of the famous Bill Toomey, and of course the two brothers played with him, Pat Toomey and Mick Toomey, and there were two others that everyone forgets, and that was Kicker Toomey and Soccer Toomey. <laughs> <laughs> everyone forgets that. But, um, but old Bill was a beautiful man, a beautiful man. He lived up in Horton Street, Heidelberg, and we, I'd run with uh, a mate of mine who was a great pro runner. <coughs> And uh, he was much faster than me, uh, Johnny McHugh. Do you, you know Johnny McHugh? Anyway, um, but I trained all summer and uh, I ran a few races in professional, not the gift, I ran in the 75 metre races and that. And it was, and actually went and tug of wars for Collingwood. The tug of war was on World of Sport and the tug of war was at the athletic meetings and we had a Collingwood team and Jerker was in it and Gabbo and all that. Gabbo, of course, was the anchor man. <laughs> but I can recall my first, I remember when we started, Tweet, what was your first year? When, were you? Are you two years after me, Tweet? But um, 65, I remember we used to run out 
around the old uh, the golf course and the, the women's prison around there. Used to, and my first training one, I must mention that because I wanted to impress. I was never at much golf, I was a sprinter, I wanted to stay up. And we ran out, we used to run out on the golf course out there, the public golf course, yeah, right there, a golf course. And then ran past the women's prison, about 120 kids, blokes, senior blokes. I led everyone after 800 metres. <laughs> I finished third last. <laughs> the only two I beat home were the jerker. It was about 16 half stone, and Gabbo was about 20 stone. <laughs> and Bob Rose, Bob Rose said to me, listen son, you're not going to have to improve your fitness if you're going to make it here. And, um, and I said, well, I'll bet two of your senior players on you. I reminded me who they were. And, uh, and then never changed after that. I was always in the, I remember running you and you uh, and Bondi, when Murray Wheelerman came as coach, we ran around that eastern golf course out there at Doncaster. I couldn't get anywhere near Twiggy and Shane Bond was probably the best runner in the club, wasn't he? But, uh, but great memories of those early days and then 66, 66, they left, left Price, dropped Pricey for, Pricey and I played in the seconds grand final, but Pricey should never ever been left out of that senior team. I reckon we would have won the flag with um, Barry playing in the centre. They brought back a couple of the older players and uh, honestly, he was a champion, Barry, and, uh, in the and they left him out. And right, right, Bobby actually, later in life, I don't, hope you don't mind me saying this, Bobby actually apologised later in life to Barry personally for leaving him out of the 66 grand final. And uh, we were beaten by a kick in the seconds grand final. The winning goal was kicked by Royce Hart, who was playing for Richmond seconds that day that Richmond went in the finals. And the, and the thirds also lost. It was and the thirds the also game. lost by a kick. Yeah. We lost three grand finals. By less than 10 points in total. Um, it was talk about an ill-fated, ill yeah, yeah, so it was just ridiculous. In, well, I played set up forward in a Victorian second side and a Norm Smith as coach and Norm Smith said to, uh, said to me, I, again I started set up forward, I then got a kick, went the full and kicked five goals in the third quarter and I did my ankle and had to go off at three quarter time. But Norm Smith said to me, when you get back to Melbourne, tell Bobby, because he knew Bob not to play you at full forward. He said you're a natural full forward. So I tweet, took over centre forward about that time at Collingwood and was a great centre forward, very underrated Twiggy. And I ended up going to full forward and I was very, very lucky, Michael, to be at that club at an era where we had a great side, Len. Uh, Len was just such a sensational ruck, ruckman and uh, it's lovely that Bronwyn, Emily are here and I've forgotten already. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Anyway, um, he was a great guy. We roomed together in that 72 uh, carnival side and uh, in those days they picked two players from each team to play in the um, in the Victorian team to try to make it even and then and I um, represented it was just lovely to play with Lenny in that carnival but uh, so I ended up being full forward after that and I was lucky to have look I had three of the best kids ever in the history of the game kicking the ball to me Barry was the best by a mile despite Wayne and Teddy the <laughs> <laughs> after that when I got a phone call out of the blue from oh, the boss at uh, Channel 9. He said, we're starting a kids program on a sun Saturday morning and we want you to be a co-comp here. And I said, what's his name? Who's the kid? And he said, oh, a bloke called Daryl Summers. I was 23 at the time and Daryl was 18. So 
over five years difference in age. He made Geelong supported Daryl. And so I started on this, this kids program and I was on for a few months and I played a show, but I was on for four hours. On a Saturday morning then I had to go and play football and I played an absolute shocker one day. And this was 1972, it is Neil Mann was coach. And I got to train on the Tuesday night and the old man said, the committee's met, you've got to give up that Saturday morning TV show. So, I was replaced by a stuffed ostrich. <laughs> <laughs> they went on for 28 years and became multi-millionaires and I was still working for a living up to about three years ago. <laughs> That's what Collingwood did to me. <laughs> but, um, um, well, Ozzy Ostrich, uh, the guy behind Ozzy Ostrich, Ernie Carroll, would be the nicest person you'd ever meet in your life. Besides Barry and Twitty, of course. <laughs> and um, it's, it's amazing. I've been back to reunions and, uh, that are, and they've been very kind to me to invite me back. And Ernie Carroll, who does Aussie Ostrich, is in his 90s now. And he was absolute gentleman and quiet and shy. You wouldn't believe he could do that stuffed ostrich, you know. But uh, it was fantastic. And at the same time, they said, now, we want you to record a song. And I said, what? Record a song? They said, yes. So that was not my idea. I didn't. I wasn't. That, I wasn't an outgoing person. They said, "No, we want you to, to record a song." That was written by Johnny Young. He wrote it for Graham Kennedy, who refused to sing it. <laughs> and so I got lumbered with, "What are you going to play?" Uh, well, there's, there's been two songs. This was this was the first one. Things to remember. Oh, that was a rock singer at Hollywood Town Hall dance right yeah. that one. That was terrible too. <laughs> it wasn't the singing that was bad, it was the song. Explaining <laughs> the the, the, the yeah, that that sort of stuff. But, um, the one that um, we have yeah. on video is the Johnny Young one, Smile. Yeah, Bob. Johnny Young wrote it. Uh, Johnny Young who was what, Young Talent time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. So this was a... Are you going to put it on now? Yeah, oh. put it on now so that we know what we're talking about. I'll take my hearing aids out then. <laughs> <laughs> out, not in. <laughs> That's Jeff Phillips, who's a cop pair of this show called Happening 71 or 2. Happening 71. Who are you? Who are you here for? Who are you here for? <laughs> I still can't hear you. <laughs> We've got Peter McKenna here, as you know. This is. Some people think this is going to be the A side. They haven't sort of made up their mind yet. Let's have a listen. Smile all the while, smile all the while. Sing a song and get your problems off your mind. I may not be too educated, but this is one thing I have stated. You know I like to smile all the while. When I was young, my father said to me, some those women, they'll lead you up a tree. They'll take your money and treat you mighty nice. But when your money's gone, the loving's gone, and they'll treat you cold as ice. So you just smile all the while, smile all the while. Sing a song and get your problems off your mind. I may not be too educated, but this is one thing I have stated. You know I like to smile all the while. Now that is all. I'm still preaching. <laughs> <laughs> now, those records actually sold them. They made charts. So this wasn't just a, you know, a, a, you know, a Warren Kappa novelty record. It was a serious producer, Johnny Young, was a few, most of you guys would know, was a big name in Australian music. I mean, that is a truly terrible song. <laughs> it was still, it was it charted. Both of your singles charted. They sold big numbers. They were on the charts for one day. <laughs> <laughs> always talk down your own achievements. But you actually love music. 
No, yes, I do like but my well, sort of stuff actually. No, the song I sing <coughs> is that um, we all have to sing a song, all the players and, and, and Barry mentioned that uh, Tubby sang thirty five verses of quick go <laughs> And Jerker used to sing, I've got a lovely bunch of coconuts. <laughs> and he did have. <laughs> um, Len used to go and hide in the toilet because he never did want to sing. And um, it was fun. Neil Mann could sing. He was open road, open sky, he could really sing. And Wayne thought he was Tom Jones and she green, green grass at home and trolley eyes and uh, he was a lover boy. And, um, and what then we had Starchy. Well, Starchy was a little bloke. No. Yeah, Starchy was a, a little, tr um, a guy that would come in, the, he, he would do all the drinks and everything. You know how you have a guy in a club who would do all the odd jobs, all for nothing, you know. And he used to get up and pretend he was Shirley Temple and sing on the good ship lolly. <laughs> And he, he really took it seriously, didn't he? On the good ship, holy pop, pop. It's like Shirley Temple. It was, they were, but I'll tell you what, they were the best nights we could ever have. And, and what song did you sing? What was your way Bay? I used to sing uh, the oh, Irish yeah. ballad, um, Galway Bay, because I was brought up on Irish music by my dad. And um, that was made famous by um, Bing Crosby. So I'm... I used to love the old stuff, Nat King Cole and uh, the proper singers, not the headbanging singers. <laughs> uh, Elvis was all right because he sang a few ballads too, but my hero singer as a teenager was the big O, Roy Orbison. And I went to see him at Festival Hall uh, with the Beach Boys. The Beach Boys are a great group, they were on the same program and uh, That's a hell of fantastic. We should be there at that. How did, I mean, by the time, you know, also over there, you, have, you know, you released an autobiography, you're releasing records, you're on TV, you're winning all these football popularity contests. How did you deal generally with all the fame and adulation? Oh, look, hopefully I didn't change much because uh, being a West Tyler boy tweet, we didn't change. We were West Tyler If I ever ran into anyone, from our area who said they grew up in Heidelberg, I was always, always would say, no you didn't, you grew up in West Heidelberg and be proud of it. Because everyone thinks West Heidelberg is the Olympic village. And the Olympic village can be a little bit rough at times. <laughs> where Twiggy and I grew up, and we had another, had another teammate, well it was three of his, the other team had three of his torpedo punched at my place and half a got punt at mine. His place was Ricky Watt. Uh, Ricky Watt. Uh, he lived slightly closer to me than uh, Twig. Twig was just up around the corner. But, uh, but Twig was mad South Melbourne supporter. I was a crazy. I was not Collingwood. I had a sister who was crazy colleague with me in love with Murray Weaverman. I married for Essendon as a kid because of one of the tough kids in the neighbourhood was a mad Essendon supporter, so he taught me into it. So it was funny. It is funny though, isn't it? Twig and Barry, Barry was a Collingwood supporter, so it's funny when you play against your heroes when you're a young footballer. And I played in the 1960s. My first final was a preliminary final of 1965. We're playing Essendon, and Duncan Wright knocked out John Somerville in the well. He made it fainted. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, five minutes into right. the game, John Somerville's flat out in his back and was carved off on a stretcher. I was playing on my all-time hero, who I'd seen put three blokes in hospital in the three previous years, Bluey Shelton. <laughs> Number 10 for Essendon, a big, rough and tough red-headed centre back and he, was, he wasn't dirty, he was just... I saw him put three blokes in hospital when I was a teenager, hip and shoulder, when you can run through a bloke down the middle. I was carted off in stretches so I were and I clapped them all the way to the county, which is pretty horrible. <laughs> 
then I was playing, I mean, and when John Chuckle got knocked out, he walked up to me, he said, son, you don't need that ball, I'm going to put your head through the grandstand. <laughs> this is my hero. <laughs> Bobby Rose, of course, was my coach. The runner was Colin Rose, his brother. Colin happened to be walking past, telling everyone to calm down. I said, Col, tell Bob to get me to full forward quick, will you? <laughs> so I became a full forward, basically, being shit scared and running. <laughs> <really shocked. laughs> and so I ended up going to full forward, actually, I think there were a few goals on, because I looked down there, Barry Davis was full back. And he was a gentleman, a champion footballer. Uh, being end up playing for North. So uh, there we go. So I became a, basically a full forward out of being scared of Bluey Shell. Well, that's as good a motivating force as any. Um, the fifth item, and you have to excuse the level of personal indulgence with this, but there is a point to it. Um, as a level of, or an indicator of the level of Peter's fame had reached, um, by the early 1970s, the Collingwood Footy Club had been so inundated with requests for autographs and photos and things like that of Peter. But they had some printed up um, with his uh, autograph printed on to save Peter from the hassle of having to sign tens of thousands of these things. I wrote to the footy club in the early 1970s, or about 70 or 71, or something like then, um, asking for the best wishes from Peter McKenna. Therefore, obviating the need for do, to do that in the first place. And I just Without the risk of embarrassing you, Peter, I want to ask you. I, I assume you did that for everybody that wrote to you. I don't know that there's ever been a footballer that has done more to look after his fans than Peter McKenna. I mean, <laughs> you've got a pre pre signed photo and. There were tens of thousands of these things that must, of these requests that were coming in, and still we wanted to put a personal message on top of that. Is that just the way you felt about no, your fans? I, I just feel strongly about the Collingwood supporters were sensational to me, sensational, and to Collingwood supporters think all their players are champions <laughs> and that's why Collingwood supporters are so great and, uh, and they were so good to me. I did never leave Collingwood to go to Carlton out of choice. People think I'm that I was out of football, I lost half a kidney when I got dropped sentence at time. So I went to Devonport and played in Devonport when I felt well again and I got a teaching job in Devonport. Then when I came back in 1975 when Hayfield took over as Tom Hayfield, I should say not as, as coach. Collingwood, I was probably at the end anyway. But Collingwood didn't really want me and I got approached by three or four clubs to play for them. I ended up playing a year at Carlton. Now I had a two year contract at Carlton on a lot more money than I ever got at Collingwood and I played one year and the, I could honestly say I didn't play the second year really and simply because I found it hard playing against Collingwood. I found that really tough to run out and play against Collingwood. I had too much Collingwood in me and so I went to Carlton and said well well, it, it turned out well in the end because then I got a phone call at school. I, I was teaching at Marston College. I taught a few league footballers. Gavin Brown, Steve Silvani were at Marston at the time, young Michael Irwin. But I was teaching there one day and the librarian came in and said, Oh, Lou Rich is on the phone, Pete. Oh, I wonder what Lou wants. I'd, I'd taken the job. I didn't want to coach, but I take the job coaching that year, Port Melbourne, in the VFA. And because a, a league footballer let them down at the last minute, they stuck for a coach. And they pleaded with me to sort of fill the void sort of thing. And I said, said I, after a couple of days, I said I would, but Lou Richards on the phone said, how would you like to contact the Channel 7? 
because Bluey Adams has gone overseas and we need a commentator. I said, what do I do? Louie said, turn up at Geelong next Saturday and you'll be calling with that way. Two, four forwards calling together. The commentary box, and that's the ground out there, the commentary box was down at ground level. Now you imagine that, calling the footy. It was a pouring wet day. North Melbourne were playing Geelong. Two blue and white teams. <laughs> the blondes became dark with the rain on their heads. And I tried, I reckon I was 30 seconds behind on every damn play, you know. But eventually uh, the commentary boxes went up high and it was a lot easier. And I, I was fortunate to have 20 years of Channel 7 calling the footy and travelling around Australia calling the footy with great people, you know. You were with Bernie Quinlan, you were with um, Don Scott, <laughs> who's a great friend of mine, and um, and, and, and then you had Bruce McAvaney, Drew Morford, Peter Landy, against committee with the main callers. But um, it was just fantastic to travel around Australia calling footy with these wonderful people, and uh, they're all, and Sandy Roberts, of course, who was probably the the most professional of all, he was fantastic. And a uh, great caller and a good bloke. We, um, we loved you as a commentator, but I just I just want to also say that we also didn't want you playing at Carlton. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't, it didn't oh, seem well. right to you, it didn't feel right to well, us. Well, so yeah, 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 a lot of players of my era played, went to other clubs. My teammates, Jeff Clifton, Max Richardson, Len Thompson, went to other clubs. Um, Twiggy probably would have wanted to play with South Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, now, if you ever get a microphone again, Twiggy, you tell the truth about my drop punts and your talks. <laughs> Don't you tell me? He changes the story around from the truth, you know. And oh, uh, that, that's the you want me? Can I say a few words about uh, in the... This is the thank last everyone. Item. Yeah, this is the last item. Last one, we'll do okay. That. So, and of course, it's the iconic number six jumper. Um, and this is famous for two reasons. Um, this is from the, your jumper from the 1970s. The 70 grand final. final. Um, which, of course, is you know, a, a, a bittersweet moment for, for all Collingwood fans. But it's also probably the most iconic Collingwood jumper of that era and potentially of, of all time. Everybody remembers it. But I gave that away. Yeah. I gave that away to a young trainer we had at the time, a uh, little red headed bloke, um, Peter Wilson, who was a young trainer amongst a young kid, sort of he was. So I gave him the jumper, and you know, in good faith, many years later, turned on the TV, he's a trainer at Hawthorne. <laughs> <laughs> but out of the blue one day, I get a phone call, and um, and he said, oh, Pete, now I'm at Hawthorne. I thought you might like your grand final jump back in 1970. He came around, he came around with that jumper because he thought I might like it after all these years. And he sort of latched on to Hawthorne for some reason, you know. Do you remember the little red of Wilson? The little red of Barry. Um, so how do you feel when you see that jumper and you think of everything about Collingwood? Oh, what well... Is, what does that jumper, what does the footy club mean to you? Oh, it's... I get goosebumps when I think of... of uh, uh, <coughs> friends of mine live at the Yarra Falls end of Collingwood. I won't say who they are because they might not be telling everyone where they live, you know. But very good friends of mine, mad Collingwood supporters. The, the Arab Falls in, they, they bought a unit, five foot storeys up there. There's a lot of um, high-rise buildings down that Arab Falls in, the outer end of Collingwood. On, they're on the fifth floor, so we go to their place a lot. My wife, Maria, she's not here today because she's in... Japan with my daughter, son-in-law and grandkids. Um, I didn't want to go because I had long flights and 
I've been to Japan when I was calling footy with Channel 7. I didn't go to Japan with Collingwood in the old days because we went to Darwin. Were you on the trip to Darwin? We went to Darwin. We played a, a, a Northern Territory combined team. Then everyone went on to Japan. I had to come back to Melbourne because teachers in those days could not take time off. We had to resign. If I if I'd have gone on that trip, I would have had to resign from school teaching. So I had to come back to Melbourne. They all, everyone went on to the Japan. But anyway, so my wife. We thought of you. Oh yes. I'd just like to uh, say, look, it was to play here at Collingwood, an iconic club like Collingwood, was just the most wonderful thing in my life to play with this club, to play with guys like Twiggy and Barry and Len, of course, and the Richardsons and all, all the players. And, and the people you meet here, oh gee, that's, um, wasn't I using this properly before? Um, and I'd just like to thank everyone who's here today. Now, even Graham Huggins here, now, Graham was a, a really top, one of the best field umpires in my era, but I didn't know. One, there was a night game, but one year we didn't, didn't make the finals. It was about 68, I think it was, 1968. We played in the night games at South Melbourne, South Melbourne ground. And I remember this night I had a kick a lot of goals, but well, I reckon three or four of them were dead set charity free kicks. <laughs> Graham Huggins with the umpire in that game, and I see him here today, he's a mad Collingwood supporter. <laughs> but I'm not telling anyone outside this room because I reckon I got a couple of charities on that being pregnant or something. Now, I must say too that um my last game was against North Melbourne with our gasometer ground and Collingwood were eight goals behind in the last quarter and they won. Bob Rose, I went for dinner with Bob Rose in Victoria Park with um, Maxie Urquhart and uh, what was the back pocket name? Ron Rouge? No, not Ron Rouge. Yeah. Yeah, Ian Montgomery. No, uh, he was, was on television and I, he actually did uh, Sammy Newman's kidney. Oh, not back pocket. Uh, uh, Bruce Andrew. No, Bruce Andrew. Carl Merritt. <laughs> <laughs> on TV. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll leave Scott Merritt. Scott Merritt. Who? Con Merritt. Con Merritt. Oh, you won back pocket. He's our fourth tracker. Yeah, but he did play back pocket in later in his career. Oh, we had oh. a bad argument. Next step over the fence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's nice to see you in great. Right. And as friends of mine, Brenda and, and Alex Kabarchevic and, and Grant and his lovely, where are you Grant? There's teachers at my grandkids school and her and his daughter. Anyway, I'd just like, and Michael, you and Glenn McFarlane, I just want to congratulate you on those wonderful books that you have done on Collingwood over the years. They are unbelievable. That Champions of Collingwood book is just unbelievable. But there's not only that one, there's just heaps and heaps of Collingwood books that they have done. You are absolutely brilliant at uh, the work you've, uh, you and Glenn have done. And uh, just thank you all uh, for uh, coming today. I'm very honoured that you've all turned up here today. I had a bit too much fuss off and, uh, at the time. But when you're kicking goals for Collingwood, you get made a lot of fuss off. And I was just grateful that. I played in an era where I was mentioning about people living at the end, wasn't I? I didn't finish that story. <laughs> this is getting the goosebumps. I get off the train at Victoria Park now, we go to their place a lot. Get off the train, their place at the end, as I said, fifth story, on their balcony, you looked straight down the middle of Victoria Park. They invited Marita was in Japan, that's right. They invited me over to watch Collingwood Seconds playing Carlton Seconds. I took my binoculars.
couple of weeks ago, and we're watching the races over there on the TV, and then we'd go out and watch the game. So we're walking through Penobulus, straight down the middle. But what I do, I get off the train, my wife and I, and we walk straight across the middle of the Collingwood footy ground. And that grass is much better than when we play. <laughs> but I stand there in the middle, stand there in the middle, and it looks so bloody big. Because that grandstand isn't there in the outer like it used to be, it looks, the ground looks bigger. And uh, no wonder now price of your kick looks so long and straight, you know. But, um, but it, it, you get the goosebumps because you look across, there's the race. There's the race there, and it, actually, if you go over to that race, you can almost smell the liniment from the old days. You know, like the rooms. Remember when our change room used to smell of liniment? It was a fantastic smell. And uh, and but no, thank you all for coming. I'm really honoured and uh, that you turned up. And uh, and thanks to Andrew and the past players, and uh, I've mentioned Andrew already, he was a terrific footballer in his own right, and, and he's doing wonderful things, and for the past players to organise this is just sensational, and not just for me, but for whoever comes after in that cabinet, and I'm certainly very appreciative of, uh, of what you've done there, and with the Collingwood Football Club, and you, Michael, and the Archive Committee for organising everything and, and setting that up. Thank you. Looks further downfield. A nice long drop kick down there. They're in the